Welcome to China Paradigm Podcast, where we share insights and stories from successful entrepreneurs and business people in China, and learn what it takes to succeed in a wide range of industries. We interviewed Yael Farjun, who is currently the co-leader at Travel Massive and an experienced entrepreneur who founded two travel companies, which have now been shut down due to travel restrictions. In this episode, Yael shares her 10 years of experience in the travel industry in China, talking honestly about the ups and downs, challenges, and achievements. Listen and learn. Why has TripAdvisor failed to take over the Chinese travel market? Farjun's thoughts on the flash sale approach targeting people living in China. What travel businesses have strived during the pandemic in China, and much more. Hello, everyone. I'm Matthew David, the founder of Dasha Consulting and its podcast, China Paradigm. Joining me today is Yael Fadrun.、Um, you are the founder of two companies, both in in tourism, and and、um, you mentioned previously before we started in inbound, so meaning targeting、um, foreign travelers、uh, to China.、Um, the first company. Uh, was named My Way PCM, and the second company was、uh, China Click Go. I talk to the past because we are still in COVID time,、uh, and it started、uh, in January, February twenty、uh, twenty, and we are recording now in twenty twenty one April,、um, and、uh, China is still still a hard place to go in when you are overseas、uh, and to travel is actually I think impossible. There is no tourist visa anymore. Does, there is not such a thing anymore、uh, to to go to China. So it's about a retrospective. It's about a sharing of experience of a ten year journey from November twenty ten to January twenty twenty. Uh, actually, for for my way PCM, and you are going to tell us a bit more、uh, how you 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 were able to pursue a little bit more with with、uh, China Click Go, and、um, yeah,、um, I let you maybe、uh, introduce yourself a bit more details,、uh, Yael, as I was mentioning before when we we're preparing the podcast, that、uh, I'd be very happy to hear your own words about um, yourself um, and your experience in China. Sure. Thank you, Matthew. I'm、um, very happy to be here today.、Um, yeah, introducing myself, and you know how every one of us has its、uh, his own China story.、Uh, so I moved to China in 2010、um, with no clear intention of moving to China. Just you know, you start here, you say, "Oh yeah, I'll stay for a year or two, see how things go," and then it's almost 11 years after now. Uh, and I still, I'm still here. When I moved, I worked for、uh, six months for the Israeli government.、It、was a、um, very short project at the Expo in 2010, Shanghai World Expo. And when that project was over, I knew that Shanghai is where I want to stay. It's a beautiful city.、Um, it's super interesting city, and I knew that if I go back home, I'll lose my connection with China. So I stayed. And then stumbling into entrepreneurship, technically, because、um, I had to figure out what I want to do.、Uh, I tried to apply to some jobs. I couldn't find anything that I really、um, was interested in. And I always wanted to try and build my own business. So I was like, okay, let's just give it a shot.、Um, let's be my own boss. And so I started the first company.、Um, on paper, the name is My Way PCM. Uh, no one, I think, of us、uh, of the company ever really used it. it. It's on the official kind of logo and you know the papers,、um, but everyone who traveled with us knew us by name. So it was Yael's,、um, let's say, agency, or I'm going to travel with、uh, um, either one of the names of the、um, tour guides or my、um, uh, teammates. Uh, later on, but yeah, so started、um, the travel agency. In 2010, just after the expo was over, and then in 2015 started China Click Go, which、um, I hope、uh, would be an evolvement and a, a better version, let's say, of、uh, of the first company.、Um, so yeah, 11 years here.、Uh, if you would have asked me before if I'd ever moved to another country and started a company there, I、uh, probably would have said no. But、uh, this is how things are, right? 
True. Um, I, actually, yeah, we, we believe that a lot of entrepreneurs have a clear path, a clear idea, a clear determination about what they would start at the very, very beginning. But very often, it's um, it's actually by meeting people, by chances, by um, unexpected events that they come to start something they stick with for a decade or more. And um, that seems to be a, a bit of a pattern here. It's not only about having a, a very strong determination and very, very clear plan. Um, so you you um, you have to, so two companies to 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 give uh, a better picture to the people who are listening to us. So the first one was, as you said, um, um, a company to prepare um, uh, travels. Uh, you were not that active online, if I understand correctly. Then, if you if you didn't have a word like uh, it was word of mouth, uh, it was connections or social media. And then you wanted with uh, China Click Go to create more of a platform for in 2016 um, when Airbnb did not have yet this platform of uh, experiences. And by the way, I don't know if this platform of experiences of Airbnb is really taking off um, because they have it, but I'm, I'm not seeing a lot of momentum. Maybe that's not a good year to see any momentum in that in that industry. But um, you, you had so this first initial business, which was to organize uh, 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 trips for foreigners in China. But as far as I understand, you are going to correct me if I'm wrong, uh, it was a lot of uh, getting clients through connections uh, and through uh, referrals, but not of a perspective which was to scale online. And at some point after five or six years, you wanted to make it more of scale more, to build more scalability and to uh, start to do it with China Clico, which was branded at ChinaClico.com. So it means that it, the acquisition was really online. I went on the website as well, and uh, it's 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 uh, it's mentioning uh, a, a few hundreds of, of suppliers, right, uh, providers, yeah. uh, packages. Um, so it, it, first, first, is my is my understanding correct? And would you like to add anything? Yes, um, your understanding is correct. Uh, my way PCM started, and it's interesting that you mentioned that a lot of entrepreneurs don't really have the clear path when they start. I think it's with the second project or the third project, but the first one will always be, you know, a lot of a mess and kind of like trying to figure out uh, things. And that's in a way what happened because the decision was I want to be my own boss and then doing what and so I just started you know with whatever I had with the, the first tools that I had um, and so yeah so my way uh, was a regular travel agency as you said we got 99% I would say of the clients by referrals so it took me a few years to build up this uh, the branding I started by working with other agencies um, within social circles here in Shanghai or in China at large so that, you know, everyone who had visitors to China would recommend me. Um, and a lot of us used to have a lot of visitors to China uh, before uh, the pandemic. So that was the way I started um, by foot, as we say, you know, I, I walked and knocked on each and every door. Uh, today it will be by cold calls, I think the equivalent of. But uh, yes, the idea to move online with China Click Go, it actually came in, um, I had it very early in the process. Um, I would say even, I think I have it written down on a note like in 2011, that I thought it would be incredible to have more options available for travelers coming into China than the ones that they could see back then online. Um, if you would you know, just search online on a regular search, tour to China, or let be more specific if you knew that, let's say you want to travel to Beijing, the Great Wall, or the Terracotta Warriors, if you had the idea or the knowledge about these places, um, then you would be more specific in your, you know, online search. But even then, the, the results and what you, you'll get would be the biggest companies here, the travel agencies that, you know, could pay for the first, uh, um, the first result on Google, right? So either by um, advertising or by, uh, they had just great SEO. So the small suppliers, uh, the local ones, uh, the ones that really, really tried hard to um, do something a bit more unique or, or less commercial, let's say, that targeted the, the more adventurous uh, travelers, that targeted those who were looking for the experience 
less than to check a box of, yes, I've visited this place, that place. Um, those, those suppliers had a, a lot of issues and all troubles to, to reach out to clients. And um, there are platforms existing for that, like TripAdvisor. It's probably the most uh, known one. Um, but still in China, it was very, very little. And in my travels around China, during my efforts to build my network um, and to find those local suppliers so that wherever I sent my travelers, I wanted them to have a real local experience. I got to meet incredible people that, that, that did really, really great things and didn't always have the time um, to go on TripAdvisor, let's say, or um, they encountered some issues with, with a competitor in their city that would drive their TripAdvisor reviews very low or something like that because this happened, it could happen. And I was like, we need to give them some platform. We need to get those you know, um, suppliers the way to reach out to more um, relevant clients. And that's how the idea of China Click Go uh, came from. This was one of the reasons. And the other reason was we wanted to be able to scale, to be able to address more travelers. Uh, because if you rely on the traditional uh, model, then it's a travel agent in office taking calls or answering emails. And we all have, you know, just a very limited amount of time per day. Um, that we could attend clients. And so if you want to bring more to more people, you have to go digital. And that was the idea before uh, or behind, sorry, China Clay Go. And yes, the, the, we started building in 2015. We launched in 2016. I think it was the same year that uh, Airbnb uh, Experiences was launched. And we were like, okay, great. So we our line of thinking is correct. Um, although... Um, was a very fundamental difference. We didn't we didn't have the pockets of Airbnb, um, but um, but that's okay. And in China, we actually met with them and in Shanghai when they started here. And you are correct; they didn't take off as good as they did other in other places. Um, although they do have some. I mean, twenty twenty is definitely not representative of anything. But um, before that, they started building up momentum. Uh, among foreigners, but even more among uh, um, young independent Chinese travelers. So they did have they did have traction, um, not as well as they did outside of China. That's for sure. Uh, but yeah, but when we met with them, um, they were so happy about everything that we built. They were like, "Maybe you can give it to us." I was like, "Sure, if you pay me to it, if you pay me for it, I'll give you everything I worked for in the past, you know, five six years. It was back then." Um, but no, of course, that, that didn't, ha didn't happen. Well, when we talk about foreigners traveling to China, did you, have, did you try to size the numbers? How many, how many are we talking about? How big the market is? Um, I'm asking this question because um, when you build a platform, um, the key is to have volume of uh, people going to the platform. Uh, you do a lot of SEO in a lot of di different directions. People have different objectives, but you have the suppliers in, you have a lot of different suppliers and you, you match the supply and the demand, but you need to have a sizable demand uh, in order to be interesting for the suppliers. And that's the tricky part. That's the most challenging part, I feel. Uh, that's what needs, requires a lot of money as well, or a lot of energy, or a lot of of, um, of traction, whatever, whatever, you, how you get it. Uh, but how how big the market is? Did you did you try to size it? Yes, we kept checking um, statistics from the um, inbound and outbound bureaus, the costumes, and and um, for people coming in, immigration um, offices of China. In the good years, we're talking about a little more than 100 million uh, travelers to China, but we're talking about not just travelers. A lot of them came in for business trips um, and from nearby um, countries. And then depends if you include Hong Kong in that or not. But the numbers were big. Um, the question then was how many of them actually traveled for the sake of traveling or just for business? And if it's just business, what else can you sell them? Because we did see that a lot of what we built in China Click Go was based on our experience in my way. And the experience we got in my way was that 
people of different backgrounds, and it could be a lot of business travelers as well, uh, would reach out for a half a day tour, would reach out just for um, a two, three hours experience, as today we can label it as experience because we all understand what it means. But they would seek something more than just um, the travel itself. Uh, sorry, so, so just the business itself. Um, and so a lot of what we designed was also um, targeting those crowds. So to be um, much shorter experiences, it could also be um, supporting services just as um, um, a, a transfer from the airport to where you needed it within the city, which is, by the way, if I'm not mistaken, still the number one most bought service on almost any platform um, that is selling to, uh, touristic um, um, or travel services. The the Because the easiest or the most needed thing is um, a car to take you from uh, the airport when you arrive to your first destination. From there, you can figure it out. But usually the airport is a bit, a bit more um, challenging, let's say, or just, you know, getting in is a bit more challenging. The moment you got into your hotel, you can speak with someone to help you figure out a uh, SIM card, let's say, or other things. So um, it was one of the basic services, a simple one, um, and, and easy to sell, let's say. So supporting services like that, um, a transfer, um, a translator, so someone to join you translating um, for meetings, for example, all of these services that are supportive of business travelers uh, was something that we found needed uh, because of our uh, former travelers. So we created those two um, to address um, to address the business travelers as well. So the good day, yeah, it was a good enough volume. Um, yeah. I'm very surprised by the number. Uh, one of the I, 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 to be honest, I was checking online as well. Uh, yeah. And um, I... <laughs> I, the numbers are still impressive for me. I, I get all the numbers. I get more about 30 million people, but it depends on how you count. If you count the number of trips, yeah. the number of travels, travelers, um, and um, it depends. You Hong Kong. Maybe you don't Hong Kong, Hong Kong. Hong Kong. Yeah. yeah, true, true. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's more sensible than what I was thinking in there. Uh, so if we try to size the the size of the market in, in, in USD. So if we take the number of 30 million people, let's say, going to uh, mainland China uh, for, for, for traveling, for, for tourism, um, how much would you, they, they spend? They would, on average, spend $1,000, $2,000, and then it's a market of 30 billion. So then, then it's sizable. If you take 1,000 USD as a, as an average, um, it, we're talking about uh, 30 billion RMB, uh, you, you, you just don't, 30 billion USD, sorry, market. So indeed, that's, that's maybe indeed a size where a marketplace could make sense. Um, and that, that's, that's sizable enough. Uh, they might not use all of them English, but it's, they, they certainly have to at some point. And um, so they would go through a platform. I, I, I get it. Um, so... What what do you, what do you feel uh, compared to TripAdvisor? Uh, what was lacking or Airbnb uh, experience? My understanding so far, my hypothesis would be that uh, TripAdvisor was not good enough to get good suppliers, meaning they were not friendly enough, they were not uh, accessible enough, understandable enough, um, easy easy to to be read as well from a Chinese supplier to a, a foreign audience. That would be the hypothesis I would have. What, what's your take on this? Supervisors should have taken it, right? Taken it. Yeah, and I think I think at the bottom line when we uh, check things, yes, TripAdvisor, I think, is doing still the best in among all of these platforms. And I know quite, I would say, around six or seven different platforms um, that tried their luck in China. TripAdvisor was actually the one that did that eventually found the right way of doing things. When they started, I think they just wanted to test the market, and so they didn't invest much in it. Uh, so they just created the Chinese website. They made it possible for local suppliers to um, upload their tours, but they always remained um, focused on inbound, so foreigners coming into China. And let's get, let's be real, the actual numbers of travelers in China are not foreigners, even if it's a sizable market, as you just said. 
um, it's still very, very small in percentage compared to the local market. And then you would compete with Citrip, uh, which is, or, or Feiju, or uh, which is the Alibaba uh, bot platform. And, and other ones that came later on, uh, let's say in the last two, three, four years. Um, and competing with that as a foreign company, that's always a challenge. Um, they do have offices here in China. They were smart and something that what they did was very smart, in my opinion, that they realized it's too big. China is too big to try and take over everywhere and every place. And so they actually um, had contact points in specific cities that were the highest interest for inbound travelers. Uh, so Beijing, Xi'an, um, Guilin, let's say Guilin and Yangshuo area, um, Hong Kong for sure. And they made sure that these salespeople technically, because what they did was, or, or business development people there would reach out and maintain contact and communication with the local suppliers. So um, they, their model eventually became smarter. I think they just took it slowly, realizing where their strength and where their weaknesses and what they can and cannot do. They made an assessment. They actually, I've met them, I've met some of their people um, in China and some out of China in, in conferences. And I've realized the path that they've taken. Um, I can say on my point, from my point of view, this was my mistake with China ClickGo. Um, and of course, again, I could argue I didn't have the money that they did and, you know, other things doesn't matter because bottom line, it's the results, right? It's what you get. Um, I think it was easier for sure for TripAdvisor to start big because they had the resources and the ability to build big. But even they found out that um, eventually that the right way of doing it is going small, is starting small from one place and then going to another and then going to another and going to another. Um, when we started, we were like, no, let's start, let's open all over China. So when we started China Click Go, we opened, I think it was 51 destinations within China. And we are not TripAdvisor, right? We're much smaller. We were the most, the highest, we were a team of uh, nine people. So yeah, the differences, of course, um, one of the things that I can say for sure that I know looking back, we should have started smaller, even with an online uh, agency like that. Start with Shanghai, which was our base and the place we knew the best, then move to others and little by little build it, but not go that wide, that big, so fast. Mm, yeah, yeah I, I, my personal experience indeed, even if you go to larger cities like Wuxi, for instance, um, uh, you, you cannot find much in terms of support to discover the city uh, in English, uh, es especially if you want something a, a bit um, um, a bit deeper uh, um, of an understanding of the city and 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 travel around the city, which is a bit contrarian to um, the history of tourism in China, because um, um, when you read the, the history of China, you have some um, some writers who wrote book about how to visit China in the Ming Dynasty, so 400 years ago, 500 years ago, 600 years ago, I think even, um, and uh, those books were very um, widely uh, read actually uh, at that time already and to discover China and talking about those beautiful landscapes. So not to have access to those uh, resources which are existing in Chinese or sometimes in English, but not well known, that, that's still very frustrating uh, now. Um, so got it on the, on the, on the fact to, to start small, to try things. Um, the first question I have to myself is that um, have you tried to actually target the people living in China? I feel uh, they, you could have an approach which is more like flash sales with them to tell them we are going to organize because it's more captive audience. So you 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 could offer them, um, and I, I think some players are doing that, um, a plan, a discovery of China saying this weekend we will discover Wuxi, this, the other weekend we will discover Nanjing and so on. And that help you to um, uh, focus your energy on it. Is it something you explored, or you you your aim was always always to be a platform, and you wanted to stick to it a little bit, maybe with idealism, 
because I feel there's a bit an idealistic perception on uh, getting the, the good people, giving the good people with knowledge uh, visibility. So I, I'd like to have your, your view on that. The, the flash sales model, which seems to be more easy to manage in terms of uh, money-wise. Uh, so yes, we did try. Actually, the first things that we did was um, to target the local um, communities, um, expat communities mostly. Um, definitely, definitely, definitely. We said this is you know the easiest crowd to get started with because they're here, they're nearby. We know many of them. Um, flash sales we did sometimes. Um, it was interesting. What we what we discovered was was very interesting in terms of first of all a lot of foreigners who live here they don't understand the need of having a tour guide. They're like, but, but I can speak some Chinese or I can find my way around. And it's like, tour guide is a bit more than, you know, helping you find out your way around. Oh yeah, but I, I've learned about it in university or I know the history here or there, I can read a little bit or my local Chinese friends will take me and show me around. Why do I need to pay for a tour guide? And then we didn't go into the group traveling. So we always did individual, um, uh, small, um, um, uh, let's say a group of friends or a group of, or, or just a family. And um, many of the group travels, um, first of all, it's a high competitive uh, market already. There are quite a few of those targeting foreigners here. Um, and not necessarily worth the, the money earned for that. So at some point, yeah, we said, let's give it a try. Let's even um, uh, collaborate with a local supplier. We don't need um, to compete with them. The website is a platform for everyone, even if they sell um, group tours. We're not, you know, um, as long as they're of good quality and not necessarily high end, but good quality, uh, good service, um, basic but good, we're fine with, with giving it um, a place on the platform. But the thing was that they didn't really need us for that. They had WeChat and WeChat groups. Uh, they had the local reach already. So the platform was just an extra thing that they didn't really need, um, especially among the foreign communities, the expat communities here uh, that are pretty tight. And, and a lot of people just know each other. So we're going back to word of mouth, right? Uh, less uh, uh, advertising is needed. A lot of word of mouth and, and person to person recommendation um, were actually better. So we tried. We definitely tried. But we realized, first of all, that a lot of people would argue because uh, of things about not really understanding why they need a tour guide, unless it was a very specific tour, let's say a, a food tour. Then, yes, uh, we wanted the, the different experience um, or, or a dedicated tour in Shanghai. There is the Jewish tour of Shanghai, which is everyone knows that if you take it, it's not just go to visit the places you get the history behind it, you get the whole. So there is, you know, there, there were very specific ones that were sold quite well because they were niche, because they were specific. But the ones that, you know, go and visit a place, oh, yeah, I can have my Chinese friend um, helping me doing that. I don't need to hire a tour guide. And uh, the different in perspective, um, that taught us a lot about the local market and its needs, actually. I see. I see. Um you talked about uh, things you would have done differently. First one would be to to target to be to to look at a smaller size of suppliers and to target maybe a specific place, maybe Shanghai uh, to start with, and then the surrounding of Shanghai, less well known, less competition, but also less um, demand audience. Um, and it, actually, I, I strongly believe we learn um, a lot from from um, some some mistakes we do, some some failures and so on, um, much more actually than success. Very difficult to know why we succeed, but it's much more easy to understand why uh, we we did something wrong. What else do you feel um, is no one has still understood or succeeded to create such a platform which is giving visibility to the world of all the other places to visit in China. And actually that came to me during COVID. I, I traveled more within China. And mm -hmm. I realized how rich in terms of landscapes, in terms of uh, histories and stories China was. It's obvious actually, but I didn't realize the, the scale of it. And the fact to be the fact that you have to be within China, you travel within China, you travel to place which places which are lesser known. So what what's what's what else do you feel you would have done differently or you would have suggested someone to do differently, or if someone would like to be to, to you to be on the board 
of his company, uh, high company, uh, within the same segment, and they want to enter China. What would be your your key takeaways? Oh wow, a few. Um, well, I think something's changed. Quite a lot of things changed actually from when I started 10, 11 years ago, and uh, where we found ourselves at the end of, let's say, just before the pandemic. First of all, the type of travelers changed. So if we're talking inbound, okay, uh, first, let's say it's, a, it's one segment of travelers. So when they come, came to China back then, 10 years ago, there was even less understanding of what China is, what you can or cannot do here. Travel here as a foreigner was even more difficult than what it is today. Today is, is actually relatively doable um, in many places, even the small places. And, and you can see... Um, a proof to that also in the rising number of backpackers, which 10, 11 years ago, you saw less because backpacking in China was not as convenient as it was maybe in other countries um, around China even. But it became easier or less um, intimidating and less um, 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 difficult. And so you see, you see more backpackers, you see more independent travelers. Um, well, t while 10 or 11 years ago, it would be uh, more groups and also the profile. It used to be much more the older people. Um, so those who would take private tours, the ones that we did, uh, private tailor-made tours would be people around their 60s, retired. Uh, they had uh, available cash flow um, and they really came to China to explore. But they only had, let's say, 10 days to two weeks. In that amount of time, for those of us living in China, you know that you cannot make too much, uh, you cannot see too much in China. Um, there is, as you just said, it's it's so vast, it's so diverse. There's so many different things to do here. So they would come for the very basics. They have to see the Great Wall, they have to see the Terracotta Warriors, the things that they've heard about. Um, also, flights to China were much more expensive and visas were more difficult to get. All of that changed um, in the last 10 years. And traveling into China became easier and cheaper. Flight, for example, to China. Um, you know what, if I'm comparing not from Israel, but let's say the US, I took a yearly flight from Shanghai to LA or New York for, for $500 round trip, or $600. That's not a lot of money. It used to be thousands. So when you talk about thousands, it less people coming in. But when you reduce the, that, the uh, flight price, of course, more people will come. So we actually started seeing um, a change in behavior. Some of our clients from 10 years, from nine, eight years ago, they actually returned for the second tour and the third tour. So, But this was a new thing. Um, so if one thing that changed is the profile of the people traveling, um, and for if when they are changing, when the profile changing, expectations expectations are changing, and the services that you provide should change accordingly too. If at the beginning we had a lot of customers that wanted us to take care of everything, book my hotels, book my flights, I, I want you to take care of everything because they were afraid of doing things on their own. Then with the rise of um, online platforms like TripAdvisor, like um, um, in China, I mean. Uh, like uh, um, Ctrip and with their English name trip.com, um, Booking came into China, Agoda came into China. So suddenly it became much easier to book hotels, for example, online. If you do that and it's within a platform that you've been working with, for example, booking, you know, booking your hotels in other places, it would make sense to keep booking there because you would get points, you would get um, discounts. So people just referred to that and, and suddenly we found ourselves, okay, at some point, no one's asking us anymore to book their hotels for them. So it's only the tours. So you had to adjust. So one of the things that I would definitely say is keep your um, eyes open and hands on the pulse of understanding the fast changes. Uh, and they are fast, although compared to, relatively speaking to the Chinese changes, they're not as fast, which is good. But there are changes all the time. The, the profile of the people traveling, um, their demands, their expectations, and the things that they can do on their own, and then what they actually need you for. Um, so make sure you change. If I would be in a board today, I would, 
depends on which company, if they're starting from scratch, one of the things that I, again, and, and this is another um, um, uh, lesson that I uh, learned the hard way. When you start start small, um, that we said, of course, but don't rush to build your own thing, especially not in China. If you are in China, they have their own systems. They have their own platforms. Understand how those platforms work and try to work within them. Don't go ahead and, and rush into opening or starting your own app or even on a mini program, or although a mini program could be uh, better, let's say, a uh, place to start. Um, don't rush into invest in, in all of that before you fully understand how things work in China, exactly what is your market position um, and what you can add, like what is your added value, what you can actually do. Uh, because until you figure that out, everything would be a waste and, and you should be, a, um, no, but not necessarily a bad waste, but this is kind of like the learning curve. You need to understand you're going to invest until you fully understand your place in the market, your uh, value proposition and how it's the right and what and how is the right way for you to, uh, to work. Interesting. Um, I, th yeah, I think that that's valid for any industry. Not just, might um, add one example here. Uh, I, we interviewed in this podcast the, the co-founders of uh, Baopao. Uh, I don't know if you know them. Mm -hmm. you know them. Yes. So uh, they basically translated and make it two, two, uh, two values they bring, translation and ability to um, buy easily. Uh, on Taobao from, from overseas and for, in English. And um, other people could have thought of creating another marketplace and uh, to onboard people in English and all those players of Taobao and to get them. Of course, this task is just impossible and they will never reach the level of Taobao. So the value they were bringing was translation and transaction. And they limited to that, not owning the, 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 the supplier contact and so on. So that's to illustrate what you just said, I believe, is that in some way you can already use the existent um, portfolio of Tuna, of, of, of C-Trip, um, um, of Elon, um, right? And all the other yeah. players, uh, instead of creating a, a new marketplace where you, you need to to restart the infrastructure and everything. That, I'm, I'm correct when I'm, when I'm saying that, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I would say even, um, you know what? Well, let's take it the other way around. Even Citrip, with their big platform and the, the budget and you know, the, the connections to suppliers and everything, even they, one of the things that they did, that, that they do, is creating WeChat groups, local ones, so wherever someone is booking something on their website, they give them the opportunity, uh, the option to um, log in, to uh, be added to a local widget group. And then they have a local agent in that local widget group that keeps um, uh, uploading and publishing um, tips of what you should do, things that are happening in the city, where they go, um, you know, inf relevant information, important information when during the pandemic. So uh, let's say uh, where to go to how to check your fever if needed, if you're feeling uh, wrong. So, so even they took from the platform, um, you know, making sure that they have the personal connection somehow on which are groups, regular ones. So yes, if you are not Citrip, if you're not coming with the brand of Citrip, with the ability uh, and the connections of local suppliers that you have, then start the other way around. Start with those small groups with the personal connections. Yes, it's not the most scalable to begin with, but at least you start with the crowds. It is also easier after that to come to an investor and say, look, this is what I already achieved. I have a base. I've built a brand or something. And then, you know, if you are a startup. So it depends on what size of a company you're starting in China. If you're starting from zero, if you're starting with a little bit more um, depth and, you know, abilities. But yeah, I'll definitely say use the ones that you have. You can even, there are even uh, Taobao agents. Someone posted in, in one of the groups yesterday. So it's it's a, a person, a private individual that is helping others finding on Taobao the right things that they need. That's it. That's, the, that's their, you know, initiative. Um, and people will reach out and say, well, I'm looking for this, I don't know, air purifier, um, uh, a pen or, you know, whatever. And they would come back, come back to them with several uh, options, good ones. 
Um, and then they'll go and buy on their own. They might, or he would own, order for them with a bit of commission. It's just as, you know, creating a marketplace, but tailor made in a way, or kind of like, you know. Very so if you understand. Right? Very intimate yes. because it is within your very intimate. Have, it, is, it is within your your pocket all the time and very connected True. to your to you. And when um, you do services and it's people you're dealing yeah. with, you cannot do only digital. You have to keep that intimate person in person kind of connection. Talking about services, talking about uh, people, um, and talking about. Um, the, the, the fact that you need scale. My question on this industry, the travel industry, is about the margin. I feel there is pressure everywhere. Uh, there is pressure from the suppliers who, who try hard to, to work on their tour. There is a pressure of the um, acquire of clients, the platform. Uh, there is a pressure of the client and uh, client who, who has a limited um, uh, amount of money, to, I mean, defined uh, amount of money, which can be sizable, but it's defined most of the time. Um, and it's not unlimited. And um, what 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 about the margin? I, I don't know if that's something you have information on in, in the industry. If you have a higher level of picture, uh, I I, di I discussed in this podcast with someone organizing events, and I was very very surprised how transparent uh, it was. Rivia events, um, and I was very uh, surprised how transparent the industry is on the margin. They take twenty percent out of the suppliers. So if you need to organize a big event with a, a magician with a, uh, a show with drones with a QR code in the sky, in the sky uh, as we saw recently, they would say, we organize everything, we take 20% on it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Which is a bit um, um, easy to calculate, but a bit contrarian to me because it pushed to inflating the cost of all those events. But that's another story. What about the level of margin in, in, in this industry when you're an intermediary, when in the, in the travel agency, are we talking about 10, 20? 30%? What, what, what's the standards? So it's interesting that you're asking because um, I would say, okay, the standards on tours, so no hotels, no flights, just the tour, the travel itself, um, can be somewhere between 15 to 35%. So different um, platforms charge different percentage. Um, and the, it changes also varies because of uh, the length of the tour, the complexity of the tour, those kind of things. So it could be down to um, one by one specific overview of, okay, this is the service you submitted. This is how much you're going to, so not necessarily one, you know, bracket and that's it. There might be a lot of um, um, differences within a segment, but then you have uh, the things that it's a bit more, it's a bit easier to um, just define, you know, this is, this is the percentage and that's it. For example, um, cars, uh, group tours, um, and then hotels and flights. So all of the big platforms will tell you, and we're talking digital, all of the big platforms will tell you hotels and flights are the number one selling point for them. This is what makes the most money. Um, and then there would be the tours and experience and other things. It's not a lot. It's not a lot compared to how much you put on advertising, how much you put on, on uh, uh, staffing and, and you know human resources. Um, and other things. Um, so yes, in the travel industry, it's a bit weird. Uh, but the average, I think the majority would be around the 25%. And it's interesting that you were asking, um, that you were mentioning the, the pressure. And I think most and more than anything, pressure started because these online platforms for travel are relatively new. So the travel industry worked before without it. Right. Um, I mean, people would go to a place they would have their hotel because they got recommendation by a referral from someone they know um, or they just try on their own and uh, or they had some sort of connection uh, and similar for tour guides and other things. And then came in those platforms and said, no, but now we're charging you this, this and that. And that definitely made uh, prices increase. But um, I do see a change within the supplier side. So local suppliers that were not used to the whole digital uh, aspect um, realize at some point that they have to. Because if I'm not on TripAdvisor, if I'm not on Citrip, I'll, I just it will be much, much more difficult for me to get those referrals. But if Citrip is charging me 30% or 25%, then it's not just me. They're charging everyone. 
meaning that I'm allowed to raise the prices. We also have this um, concept or, or, or perception that in travel, everything is about the price. Who can give me the lowest price? And I think that one of the things that these platforms actually created was not just um, that we are competing on the price, but we are also competing on the quality. So what do I get for, or the value? I don't know if about the quality, but the value definitely. So what do I get for what I'm paying? And yes, people will still check the bottom line, how much they're paying for it, but they will try to look why they're paying more on what seemingly would look like a similar tour. So they would like to understand why one um, itinerary would cost more. And that's actually an opportunity for those suppliers who wanted to give more um, and maybe try and price themselves a bit more um, to really offer something a bit kind of like, you know, and not just compete on the price. Because if you do compete on the price, eventually you will lose. Someone will always make it, you know, uh, cheaper than you. Um, but I, I do want to believe that these platforms actually gave us a chance. I mean, the local suppliers gave them a chance to really compete on something different. Um, it was that. And um, another interesting thing that happened then, um, if it's not just competing about the price and one of the things that they checked, and I think it was, I'm trying to remember which platform it was. They started checking about what if they put the same experience or similar experience um, and, and pricing it in different ways by adding more services. So the experiment, I think the specific tour was um, in Bali, I think it was. And um, they, they realized that a lot of people are just looking for a driver to take them to a specific place to take an Instagram uh, worthy picture. Uh, there are a lot of tours like that, by the way, Instagrammable uh, places that they're, they're taking you to, you know, to take great pictures. And that was the only service. So they started offering that online. They said, okay, uh, we can supply the driver that will take you to the place to take the Instagram uh, photo. Uh, or the, the photo that you can later put on Instagram. And then they added a similar tour and they said, we're taking, we'll take you to two more places. So it's not just the one place that you read about that you saw on other people's Instagram accounts, but we'll show you two more. Uh, and of course, that was a bit more expensive. And then they started adding more services to that. Um, we'll get you a good camera on it. We'll get you a drone camera on it. We'll get you all sorts of, we'll include lunch. And they added it as things that you can add on the, to the total within the tour. Um, so when you looked at it among the, the menu of all tours, like the, the list of all of them together, the price at the beginning didn't see much of a difference. But then you clicked in and you go in and you see the things that you can add. And they realized that actually the majority of the people will not necessarily book the cheapest tour. But many would actually book the, the price in the middle. So they would, you know, they would choose something in the middle. And then there will be those who would go for the full package that cost quite a lot. That the first time everyone thought, no, no one will take it because it's, it will, you know, too pricey. But people actually go in and say, no, this is the right experience that I want. And I understand that if I add this, 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 and that, then it will cost me this number. Um, the percentage, though, that um, every platform is taking um, is not a common um, um, information that has been shared outside. It's internal discussions with suppliers, um, I would say, but it is known within the travel industry. So all of us know uh, what would be expected if we want to go on Citrip or TripAdvisor or any of the other big ones. Okay. You, so we know the impact of COVID, especially for the inbound. Um, how do you see the, um, the, the end of the year next year uh, and the exit? Uh, how is it going to, to change this industry? Um, um, is it going to um, 
um, be basically we will have two different industries, one in China and then the rest of the world, and they would be even harder to connect because China would have built in between um, an industry on WeChat and its own uh, channels and all in Chinese because we don't need to cultivate anything in English anymore here. Uh, would it be that things are going to go back to the to, to how it was before, or is it going to be uh, something totally different where? Um, actually, China would have become more now uh, during the COVID because it has attracted the eyes of a lot of people because of its success of managing the pandemic. And then uh, people would feel safe actually to travel to this country uh, if they can. Um, I think the travel industry in China was always separated in the world because everything you mentioned, um, not just the language barrier, which is the first, uh, but also because of their local ecosystem and and everything that has to do with the online things that are happening here that don't happen outside of the world. And for um, international companies that were trying to work in China and, and you know, reach Chinese uh, travelers going outside, um, they had to localize their, their, their um, advertising, their uh, point of contact, everything had to be localized. On the inbound, that was always our biggest challenge. How do you bring people from a different ecosystem to our ecosystem? So in terms of internet, try to explain travelers that when they come into China, they won't be able to use their Google Maps anymore and Facebook and Instagram. That was always a challenge. So how do you face that? We had a whole protocol of preparing our travelers before they're coming to China. Um, so this is this is no not a new thing. This would be this would continue to be um, as it was before. What I am thinking though that China won't open that fast that easy. Um, although there are rumors of um, you know the autumn around September October, and we do all have to remember there is the uh, Winter Olympics coming not not in in so much time from now. Um, it would be winter 2022. So it's about six months from now. Oh, no, a bit more, eight, nine months from now. Um, China doesn't want to cancel that. Uh, and so they will have to allow some what of a way of travel. It might be only groups at the beginning or authorized kind of like arrivals so that they can make sure they're checking, you know, um, quarantine if needed or checking for the um, um doing their checkups for for the pandemic for the virus um so it could be it could be different regulations but if there is something that i'm sure um resonates with you as well when i say when china decides on doing something they will find a way to do it and they will make it happen and um it will be just new regulations that we'll see happening uh, but they will create a protocol for people to start coming back i think for them the first thing that is most important is business and that's what they're trying to facilitate. So business trips will be more important for them to um, open up for um, before, let's say, regular travelers are coming in just for uh, travel sake. Uh, so business uh, reasons will be higher in priority um, for coming into China. And I think we start seeing that with the green passage and the open doors between um, I think so it's China and Hong Kong now, China, uh, mainland, sorry, and Hong Kong. And then you have Singapore um, and Japan and Korea. So the nearby um, countries. Um, and I can say we have uh, that um, there are headlines about Israel, too. So let's see if any of that happens. Um, but travelers, travelers, I don't think China is anxious to have it because they have enough from their own local um, demand. It's not like um, um, Thailand, for example, that about 80% of their GDP is counting on inbound travelers. So they will have to have it as fast as they can. They will have to allow travelers coming in. In China, they can do well with their local uh, market uh, for the time being, but they will have to start opening up um, business and then, of course, the, the uh, Winter Olympics. It's a good point. I'm... I'm um... I heard a lot about the fact that China would be very careful until August, until October. August because yeah. the wonderful eve of the 
um, Chinese Communist Party and um, in the October because it's National Day, 1st of October. But I, I, I'm, it's good to see also the pressure that will um, some way push or incentivize uh, the government to open up uh, for, for, for travelers to come back and the Olympic, Olympic Games is one of them for sure. Um, yeah. But CIIE was, could have been as well on occasion, but it, it was not. So uh, Olympic Games is certainly bigger, certainly more important, certainly uh, more international, has to be more international. Uh, so yeah. certainly um, we'll put more pressure on the necessity of opening up. Yeah, yeah. What about about the players uh, during COVID time, um, which have uh, uh, changed or which have uh, disappeared or which have uh, or, or accelerated in the tourism industry? Would you have some uh, some stories to share or some names to share uh, as? As an ex an example, I think Four Seasons closed their 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 hotels in Shanghai, and I, I'm surprised a few people talked about it. But I, it, it happened very quickly, from my understanding, after COVID. And I I try when I try to understand what happened in their mind uh, in the, at the management level, they certainly saw that the international travels would not come back, the business travel would not come back very easily, very soon. And I believe that um, large part of their Revenues or profit, at least, uh, and, and and the conclusion was very clear, very quick. Uh, they closed both of them, right, in Shanghai. Yeah. Yes. I think they were not the only one. All of the hotel chains um, suffered yeah. quite a lot. We know that Hilton got uh, hit very bad here as well. But that's not. This is the thing. I think that, and I've heard that in different industries as well, and from different types of businesses. If your finances were not in the best place before the pandemic, yes, you probably did not survive the pandemic. And that, that's true for everyone and everything. Um, and yes, of course, the, the travel industry was impacted the most. And I think one of the things that people don't understand, it's not just hotels and flights and, and tour guides and cars. Travel industry in the world accounts for 11% of world GDP. That's huge. It means that almost one of every 11, 10, 11 people is somehow connected or benefiting from the travel industry. That's huge. And when something like that has been, you know, hit so bad, it, you know, the fallback, the domino effect is just, is just ridiculous. Um, but, and it's interesting to see China was also the first one to recover. So for all of us, and I include myself in it, who only um, um, put all of our stakes on inbound travelers, yes, that was the wrong decision to make. That was um, not fully looking at what's going on, you know, and making and putting your eggs in different baskets. So yes, those who, who counted only on foreigners coming in, they couldn't survive. Uh, but everyone else and among my colleagues, um, big and small, those who shifted, those who looked immediately on the local market and said, okay, what can we do with what we have here? Those that were a bit more adaptable and flexible, they survived and they thrived even. So within my colleagues, um, quite a lot of smaller companies, they, it, yes, it was not easy for them. It was not immediate. It took time to figure out, you know, what's the next step. Um, but they were able to stand back on their feet. They, they started new services. They realized that they need to approach different markets, as you said before, um, uh, the local expat uh, market, for example, and local Chinese market, which uh, some um, foreign owned companies before didn't even try to. But then this time they realized maybe we can and they did and they and they figure out that it's, it's actually working and they do have people buying their services. One of the good things that happened here um, that at the beginning when the pandemic started, um, Chinese government realized that the travel industry is going to be impacted very fast. Uh, and they actually helped almost from day one in, in terms of um, either they um, returned deposits so that they could pay immediate uh, debt. Um, so every travel agency in China has to put some deposit into government um, aid, um, um, accounts um, to support them, you know, if in, in any case of disputes or any issues or any trouble so that 
the clients will always be able to get their money back. This is one of the terms. Uh, and so when the pandemic started and no one really knew when the travel industry will be able to start working again, um, China, the first thing they did was opening those deposits and give it some of it, give, if not all, but some of it back so that the end users, the end travelers will get their money back. So one of the first things, and that happened already in February, I think, or, or beginning of March. So very, very early. The second thing they did, they offered uh, money support to many of the companies, my company included. So I actually got money in the bank to support my company from not uh, bankrupting. Okay, so that was it. Um, they were, it depends on where you um, uh, were housed, where your company was housed, if it's private owned or government owned buildings. Uh, if it was government owned, bil owned buildings, uh, they would not charge rent or other things. Uh, taxation was reduced to almost, I think, either 1% or even 0%. Um, and it's still happening uh, this year. So even though the travel industry in China recovered relatively fast, um, and doing it pretty well, definitely compared to everything that happens around the world. Um, it was there was a lot of support from the government, um, even even for foreign owned uh, companies, which is which is you know, um, which is great. So um, yeah, I think that those of us who only focused on inbound and maybe finances were not exactly as we could see with the four seasons. There were a great hotel. How come? They had to, you know, close after two months of no activity because you see other hotels in Shanghai, everyone is working and they're pretty full. So there was something probably bad going on there before and the pandemic, pandemic just accelerated things. Um, I'd like to, to add one, a few things because you raise a couple of elements which are uh, common misconceptions about China. As the mm -hmm. first, that bis foreign businesses are treated differently than Chinese businesses. Uh, that's partly true. But the rule is very clear and very well known. It's about sectors you cannot go into, like agriculture is difficult, uh, um, working in defense sector is, is, is yeah. impossible. Cyber, uh, I think, yeah. those kind of things. It, it, it's clear. Um, uh, even education, it's clear. Uh, you, 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 but, but on the other hand, when you have emergency rules, emergency uh, um, um, regulations, um, you, everyone is treated in the same way. And when you 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 sell an apartment, you sell uh, uh, um, whatever it is, a company, whatever it is, you are treated in the same way, tax wise as well. Um, of course, if you want to re 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 uh, you want to get back your money to your own country, you have withholding taxes and so on. But the the rule of the rules are pretty much the same, actually. That's one of the misconceptions. And second misconception. Um, or oh, second misunderstanding, I would say, I feel uh, uh, people living abroad, uh, business people, if everyone don't realize it, how pragmatic the government is uh, regarding those um, elements which are taxes, which are um, uh, uh, in, uh, su uh, supporting businesses and it uh, could be um, uh, loans, whatever. Uh, instead of uh, managing by principles, um, which could be very, from my understanding, very European, very Western. Uh, we don't do that because that's our principles, or we do that because of the principles. It's managing by being much more pragmatic, testing, learning from it, and uh, yeah. getting the economy work. Um, and maybe without asking to, to follow sp specific principles. So there are pros and cons in it. Uh, but yeah. that's something which might not be very, very understood from the West, which try to understand what principles are at stake when the government mm -hmm. is making a decision instead of what they really want to achieve in terms of results. But, but yeah. uh, that, that was a, a comment I, I was expecting to be shorter, but finally it was longer. So you, you were saying that the, the, the one which failed were the ones which are already, I'm, I'm going to caricature it, we would say, but already failures basically, and, and uh, were not strong enough. Um, and you said that some of them strived because they were able to, I mean, they were able, or they, they had uh, the energy and the, 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 the speed to um, move towards the local uh, market. Um, have you seen some of them which are doing even better? during the COVID than before? Is it something you have witnessed or some comments you have? in your, Because I believe you are very connected in the industry. 
Um, I've seen mostly the small ones. I think, again, you know, it's always the big, the comparison between a small company and a big company of, and how fast they can, each one can move, right? Um, I think the small ones were, um, could show by the end of 2020 that they actually did better um, because they were uh, faster to adapt and to change and um, um, were flexible in their thinking. Yes, some definitely did better. Um, also starting addressing Chinese market. Um, but I, I don't know if a lot, well, there was, you know, captive audience here in a way, and everyone wanted to travel. Uh, if we're talking about foreigners again, but it's not just foreigners, Chinese as well. There, there is a huge number of Chinese who are used to every year traveling abroad and now they couldn't, right? So they had to travel within China um, and they're used to a certain level of traveling. They, they're looking for things. In their own country, they're looking for things that could be interesting for them. And we all know that when we go back home, we're kind of like, it, it's not easy to please us and, you know, make us find different things within our own country. So suddenly coming from um, a foreign perspective or like a tour guide that is showing something that maybe a Chinese in his own country did not realize about his own country, about his home, that was uh, definitely a success and definitely something that no one expected. But I think... Um, Quite a lot of my colleagues rediscovered China in a way that they found new markets and new clients that they never thought of before, and that they are capable of actually uh, delivering services that they didn't think of before, um, which opened up, you know, a lot of new doors and, and opportunities. So yes, I would say I don't know if a lot, but I hear good stories from everyone uh, in the industry. Mm -hmm. It's getting, it's going to get better and better. So we can see, yes. we can, that's for sure. That's something we, we know is going to get better and better uh, because mm -hmm. it was just a, an industry with zero activity one year ago and then a lot of activity six or nine months ago. Uh, so currently we are April 2021 in uh, October 2020. Um, tourism opened again, but uh, the government was a, a bit anxious about it. We could feel it uh, yeah. and everything went well. So, uh, so I believe now we are, um, they will not have any more restriction within China, uh, but the, indeed the unbound inbound uh, will be uh, the next, um, the next topic to manage, which as you, as you mentioned, has to be managed because Winter Olympics, but uh, it, there is no easy, easy answer for sure. Um, thank you very much, Yael. It's already uh, an hour. Um, oh, and wow. <laughs> yeah, right. It, it's going yes. fast. Thank you very much. I think that's a very good um, uh, thing to, to share uh, uh, trans as transparently as you did about um, what this industry has, has, has lived. Uh, and uh, uh, for me, I think it, uh, it, it's sometimes a bit hard to ask questions because I think it's, uh, it's hard to leave it. Uh, you, 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 you are in an industry which is going well, you do things, and suddenly there is this black swan coming up. It's not because of you. It's because of, it's not because of something you could do anything of. Uh, it's just uh, happening and you cannot do anything against it. So um, I, I hope um, everything will go better and better and I, we can see it's going to go better and better for the industry. Thanks, Yael, again. I hope you enjoyed it. I did. Me too. Yes. Thanks, everyone, for listening. <laughs>